Let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer and we'll get into our message as we have our baby dedication service today. God, thank you uh, that you allow us to gather. Thank you for your word that we're going to look at. And thank you for Warner and for Nicolette and for Elsie. And what a special part of our family and of our church family they are. And God, uh, I hope that we uh, put on display for them how much we love and appreciate them. And then as we have this service today and speak about children and sacrifice to you and, uh, and our role as parents and grandparents and as a church family uh, in, in the life of the families in our church. I pray that you use this. And then as we take a few moments at the end of our service to uh, offer a moment of dedication, God, I pray that you use all of that for your honor and for your glory. I pray that you use everything we do today to draw us closer to you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So in a few minutes, we'll see how few, right? We'll see. In a few minutes, <laughs> we'll uh, we'll invite Warner and Nicolette to come, uh, come up and bring Elsie to the front, and we're going to publicly dedicate her to the Lord. And I want you to know, I, I believe that's a very powerful statement. Um, and I'm also going to ask you know, us as her family and all of us as her church, their church family to make commitments along this line as well. It's important. But first, I want us to understand a little more about what we're doing. What is what is a baby dedication? Why do we do this? And why does it matter? And I, I thought it might be helpful to do this. And we've probably all been in a church service where we did a baby dedication, right? Or most of us have. And, and, and there's a lot of confusion about what we're doing and why we do it and why it's important. And so... I want to spend a few minutes doing that, uh, talking about that, and then uh, look at uh, an example of script from Scripture about why it's important. And so that's what we're going to do. So, um, so I, what I want to do is I want to answer two questions to help us understand what we're doing, why we're doing this. The first is, what is a baby dedication service? What is it we're doing? And then the second, which may be more important in some ways is what is a baby dedication service not? Like what are we not doing? And I think that's where I want to start today is what is a baby dedication service not? Well, first of all, it's not required. Like nobody's making anybody do anything, right? Um, this is not something that our church or any church that I'm aware of requires of families and parents. It's not something that the Bible requires for sure. There are lots of examples in Scripture where, where parents dedicated their children to the Lord. And there's several that are very well known and very very explicit that that's what's happening. And then there's a host of other uh, narratives where you can kind of read the implication of what, what's going on and how a child's being dedicated to the service of the Lord. But one of the, one of the more well known is in 1 Samuel uh, chapter 1 and you've got Hannah, who's a godly woman who loves the Lord, who cannot have children. And she prays and prays and prays and prays that God will give her a child. And she promises that, if God, if you'll give me a child, I'll give him back to you. But you can have him. He will serve you. We'll raise him. We'll make sure that he's in your service. And God did bless her with a son, a son named Samuel, who... You know, as you read, I mean, this is this account is in the book of 1 Samuel, right? When he went on to be a prominent, prominent prophet in the Old Testament, in the life of God's people. And, and this is what, um, in 1 Samuel 1, verse 27, this was her, what she said. She said, I prayed for this child, and the Lord has granted me what I asked of him. So now I give him to the Lord. For his whole life he will be given over to the Lord. God didn't require her to do that. This was her, her gratitude. This was her devotion. This was her uh, commitment to God and to raise this child. And so after she dedicated Samuel to the Lord, she left him there. They were still worshiping at the tabernacle. The temple hadn't been built. And she left him there at the Lord's tent to continue to serve for his whole life. Now listen, we're not expecting more than Nicolette to leave Elsie at church, right? If they do, I'll, I'll take care of that. I've got a car seat and we're good to go. But we're not expecting that that's that kind of dedication, that kind of service. But we are expecting 
that kind of intent. We are expecting that level of dedication. And so the first answer of what is a child dedication or baby dedication service, it's not required. But it's also, and this is important, it's not salvific, right? And that's just a fancy way of saying it doesn't have anything to do with whether or not Elsie finds salvation, whether or not she becomes a Christian. And not directly, at least. She will not leave, little Elsie will not leave this service today as a Christian. She will leave this service today as a young girl that we've prayed over and prayed for and committed to help try to lead in that direction. We know that Ephesians 2 makes it very clear. Paul says it's by grace you've been saved through faith, not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast, so that there's nothing that any of us can brag about our salvation. I didn't do anything for mine. You didn't do anything for yours, right? We talked about this a few weeks ago. I made the comment, the only role we have to play is to sin so that we need salvation, right? And we pretty much have that nailed. Like, we're good at that. And Elsie's no different. I'm going to say this. It's going to sound harsh, right? It, it, but it's the absolute truth. And I think it needs to be said. Because like all of us, that sweet little girl stands right now before God guilty and deserves to be sent to hell. Like that's, I know how harsh that sounds. I realize how... But here's the thing. So do you. So, so do I. It's true of all of us. And, and there's nothing outside of God's grace that mitigates that. Nothing. There's nothing outside the faith that we place in the finished work of Christ that has any effect on that whatsoever. Nothing. Not good things that you do. Not kindness that you show. Not the way you treat your family or the way you do your job or how kind you are to your pets. Like none of that matters when it comes to your salvation. Or mine. And in the same way, when we call them up here in a few minutes and, and I hold that baby, I'm going to hold her by the way. When I hold that baby and we pray over her, it's not, she's not going to leave here redeemed. But she will leave here having been where we committed to lead her in that direction to introduce her to Jesus doesn't bring salvation but it kind of sets her up in that direction and then the, the third thing I'll say about um, what a dedication service is not it, it's not related to baptism it's not related to circumcision both very big themes of scripture right and so first a quick word on circumcision since it applies the least <laughs> the Hebrew commandment was part of the old covenant that was given to Abraham. And we, a few weeks ago we looked at that. We're studying the life of Abraham, so we looked at that. And you go back and you find that message on YouTube, right? You can go to our YouTube channel and find that stuff. Um, but we think now about circumcision as just the, the removal of some skin, and it's not that's not what it was for or, or is for devout Jews. It it was a ceremony, it's a ceremony that indicates Trust that this physical action that they're taking identifies that individual with the physical nation of Israel. That's what ushers them into the people of Israel. It's what makes them, in a sense, Jewish. Without that, they're not considered part of the covenant, not considered part of the family. And this was this was the whole purpose of that, or at least a big part of the portion of purpose of this. We don't any longer believe that circumcision is necessary. It's not any kind of marker religious faith. Paul writes a lot about this and if you want to talk I can point you in that direction. Galatians especially. But we leave behind the practices of the Old Testament and we move forward in a new relationship with God. This was the Old Covenant. We live in the New Covenant. And Jesus brought in the New Covenant and I think it's in Hebrews he talks about how the New Covenant supersedes the Old Covenant. But a baby dedication doesn't have anything to do with that. right? It's not, it's not a replacement for that. Right? But it also doesn't have anything to do with baptism. And it's not a replacement. It's not our version. I've heard some people joke, or at least, you know, they I think they're joking. I want to think they're joking. A lot of them aren't joking. That baby dedications are just infant baptisms for Baptists, right? 
And, um, and while that's a cute little remark, it, it really could not be further from the truth. It's grossly inaccurate because of what we believe the Bible teaches about baptism. Right? Baptism is this outward symbol of our saving faith in Christ. It's this public act of being immersed in water that symbolizes how we've immersed our lives into Christ. It, it's, it's for those who have believed in Christ. They've experienced forgiveness. They've experienced that internal cleansing of their soul. And now they want to publicly make that visible. What's happened in them, they want to make that visible on the outside to those around them. They publicly take this act. And, and as, as a church and our denomination, Free Will Baptist, here's, here's the specifics of what we how we've agreed to believe baptism, what the Bible teaches about baptism. It's what our official statement says. It says, this is the immersion of believers in water in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, in which are represented the burial and resurrection of Christ. So, so there's that symbol. The death of Christians to the world. There's that symbol. It's a very simple laden uh, act that we do. It, it, it uh, represents the washing of souls from the pollution of sin. It represents their rising to newness of life, their engagement to serve God, and their resurrection on the last day. And it's all uh, a demonstration of the faith that we have had. But here's the thing, right? She just turned one. She didn't have faith in anything except that somebody's going to feed her when she gets hungry. Right? That's about, that's about where her faith ends. <laughs> and that's okay. There'll come a time when she can, can will understand this and have the opportunity to to express saving faith. And, and we hope and pray that day comes when she can be baptized. But this is not baptism. This doesn't enter into anything. What it is is an act of hope that one day she will believe. That she will publicly testify to her faith in Christ. That's part of what this is that we're doing today. So that's what it's not. It's not required. It's not salvific. It doesn't save anybody. And it doesn't relate these other rituals. So, so why do it? What, what is it? Well, first of all, it's ultimately about receiving God's gift of children, but with a sense of joy and responsibility. It's not just about a, an act that we do a ritual. It's it really the reason we do this is we want to make it clear that as we receive children, as we receive, and see children as a gift from God we see that there's two sides to that. there is great joy that comes with that but there is a heavy responsibility that comes with that Psalm 127.3 says this as children are a heritage from the Lord and offspring a reward from Him we're, we're going to receive Warner and Nicolette as her parents and, and, but we're also going to experience and express not just the joy but the responsibility that comes with being parents and raising a child to know Jesus and to follow Jesus. Uh, uh, another thing in baby dedication service is about modeling Jesus' love for children. Mark 10 is one of my favorite passages of Scripture, right? Um, there's a story that tells us pretty much everything we need to know about the way Jesus thought about children and babies. And by the way, I'm going to read this little passage and it talks about people bringing children to Jesus. The word that's translated children is a, a generic kind of word that could mean anything from, from infants who are still breastfeeding all the way up to you know children. children. The way we think about children. And so it really is, it's, it includes ones who, who when it says they're come, the children are coming to Him, they includes ones who are being brought to him and placed in his hands. And so in Mark uh, 10, we find this. It says people were bringing little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them. But the disciples rebuked them. And when Jesus saw this, he was indignant. And hear this, he wasn't frustrated. He wasn't confused by their actions. He wasn't aggravated. He wasn't even angry. Like, this is a very specific word, right? He was indignant. It made him exceptionally angry. It really upset Jesus that the disciples, 
that his own disciples were trying to shield him away, shield him away from his children, right? Yeah. And he said to them, let the little children come to me. Do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. And then, then I love this. He says he took the children in his arms, he placed his hands on them, and he blessed them. You want to know the way we ought to think about children in the church, children in our community, children in state. If you want to know how we ought to think about children, this. This is where you find it. There's a lot of other stuff in Scripture about how you know, children and how to protect and how to take care of and how to... But I'm telling you, this is, to me, is crystal clear. We're going to do this. We're going to lay hands on Elsie. We're going to ask Jesus to bless her. Why are we going to do that? We're going to do that because we believe that the Lord delights in and he wants to give the kingdom of God to children. It's also an initial step in obedience of obeying God's command to us to raise our families to know Him and to follow Him. Ephesians 6 4 says, Fathers, do not exasperate your children. My dad is here, so I'm not going to offer any comment on that. My children are here, so I'm not going to offer any comment on that. I feel very trapped in this verse today. Um, fathers, do not exasper exasperate your children. Here's the part, though. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. This is a, um, this is a high calling. It's a high calling for moms and dads. But this idea of bringing children up in the, in the training and instruction of the Lord, this is not a New Testament concept. Like this goes back with God's people as far back as God's people. Uh, Deuteronomy 6, which I had on the... Oh yeah, that's it there. See, I thought you had it on. Deuteronomy 6 says this, starting in verse 4, it says, Hear, O Israel, right, God's people. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart all your soul, all your strength, these commandments I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. And I don't want to spend a lot of time on this. We, you camp out here for a while. There's a lot of good stuff there. But here's the, here's the part that I think is important for us, right? That Ephesians verse is, you know, father, you know, father's son's aspect your children, but raise them up, train them, instruction. That's about parents. If you go back deeper into the history of God's people, this isn't just about parents. This is about all of God's people. This is about parents and grandparents and aunts and uncles and other people in, the, in that community of faith. Other people who lived in, in that covenant. Other people who are perfect. So if we apply, apply that to our context, that's you. That's you. That's whether you're extended family visiting or whether you are part of our New Beginnings family and live here among Warren, uh, Nicolette, and Nelson. That's, this is you we're talking about. The way we're to raise kids, the way we're to raise our families, the way we're to interact with one another. We're all supposed to use our spiritual gifts to help each other, including little Elsie, to grow, to love, to know, to follow Jesus. And by the way, no, church, no, no parent can do this alone. This really is a big part of the purpose of the church. That's why what we do here together is so important. Okay. A moment ago I mentioned um, the example of Hannah in the Old Testament dedicating Samuel to the Lord. There's a whole host of other examples. There's even the example uh, of Mary and Joseph who Jesus as an infant, they brought Jesus after his circumcision to the temple to present him to the Lord. That's the way that's the way the scripture describes it, to present him to the Lord. Here's God incarnate. And they brought him to the temple to dedicate him, to present him to the Lord. So that's another example. But 
the one I want to spend just a, a few minutes on as we sort of start landing the plane, right, is, is the story you actually read last week in Genesis 22 with Abraham. And we focused on a very particular element of that story, right? We focused on where Abraham uh, has been commanded to take Isaac to, and I'll read this in a minute, take Isaac and sacrifice him. And, and he believes that God's going to provide somehow. I don't think he understands how. I think he assumed, and I think the Bible teaches, he assumed that God would allow him to sacrifice Isaac and then God would raise him from the dead. Right? And it, but all he knew was he knew that he and Isaac were going to go up the mountain to sacrifice and he and Isaac were going to come down the mountain after. That's all he knew for sure. He believed it in his heart. And then when he got up there, God provided a ram stuck in the thicket for him to offer as a sacrifice, right? And he says he named the place, he named the place Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. So that's where we focus last week. So this week, I want us to pick up some little principles, some little lessons out of the story. And we'll go through this pretty quickly. Let's look at Genesis 22, the first 14 verses. It says, Sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, Take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac. That's, like I said last week, it's a powerful description. Your son, your only son, the one you love, go to the region of Moriah, sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain I will show you. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey and he took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and he placed it on his son Isaac and he himself carried the fire and the knife. And the, as the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up, said to his father, Abraham, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied, the wood, now the fire and the wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. When they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. The angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up, and there in the thicket, he saw a ram caught by his horns. He went over, took the ram, and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. And to this day it is said, on the mountain of the Lord it will be provided. He literally, totally, irrevocably gave Isaac back to God. Child of promise. Miracle child. Don't forget, Isaac was born. Sarah, his mother, was 90, and Abraham, his father, was 100, right? And here we are, this miracle child, the son of promise, the one who's going to. Abraham's going to be the father of all these people, the nations, and he had one son. For the one. There was no plan B. And so I cannot imagine. The confusion and the pain and the turmoil. He loved Isaac. It must have been imaginably, unimaginably painful for Isaac or for Abraham to tie Isaac's hands together and to raise that knife. And I'll be honest with you, I don't, I don't think I would do it. Like I'm just being real, right? Abraham believed stronger than me, most likely. You don't ever know about a situation that you're in it, right? But I'm pretty confident that I would have failed this test. There's some lessons, though, I think we can learn from Abraham. If we, if we refuse, if we fail to give our children, our families back to God, we may very well be forfeiting God's best plan and God's purpose for their lives. And so here's four aspects, very quickly, or as quickly as I can, of giving our children back to God. The first is, it's a confirmation of your love for God. This is what we see here, right? Uh, 
when we give our family, when we give our child back to the Lord, we're saying that we love God more than we love that child, which is the way it ought to be. Nothing makes me sadder when I hear, and you would hear this when I was in Bible college, or from, uh, you know, I felt like God was calling me to this, but my parents, that. I'm going to tell you, that's a painful thing to hear. When, when God clearly had gifted them and given them a work to do, and for whatever reason, their parents could not turn loose. Or when parents put so much focus on sports and athletics or drama or cheer or whatever it is, right? Whatever whatever that other thing is that it removes them. And I'm not saying those things are bad or evil or sinful. They're not. But when they overshadow God's plan for our children, for our families, then they become that. When we put our desires for our kids, for our families, for our when we put our desires, it's like any other area of life. When we put our desires ahead of God's desires, we are wrong. And we handicap those children. We prevent them from having what it is that God's plan for them. Giving a child back to God means discipline, it means limitations. Means changing my life for that child's benefit. This is what Abraham proved by his willingness to offer Isaac. He was demonstrating his love of God and his fear of God was supreme in his life, even above his love for his son. As big as that love for his son was. The second thing we see is giving our child to God is a clarification of ownership of that child. The old, uh, the old Cosby show, there was a line where the son was acting up and Bill Cosby, the dad, is a hustle, a cliff, was it cliff, I think? He, he, told me, he said, I brought you in this world and I'll take you out, right? In other words, you're mine. Like, you're mine, I'm in charge of you. And that's true, except for God has supreme ownership of that child. And when we when we give that child, when we dedicate that child to God, that's acknowledging that. That's clarifying that to yourself and publicly. That this is the plan. The child does not belong to you. The child belongs to God. We have the privilege of raising, training, loving. That's where God steps in. And that's what Abraham did. When Abraham went to make that sacrifice, he was saying, Lord, he belongs to you. He doesn't belong to me. You do with him as you want to. Or else he doesn't belong to Warner and Nicolette. He doesn't belong to me. She belongs to God, ultimately. We have responsibility as a family, and as a church, but we, but we don't have ownership. The third thing that, that when we dedicate our children, we give them back to God, it, it's, it's a demonstration of our commitment to raise our children the way God intends them to be raised. There is a way God intends us to raise our families. And I'm not saying that there's no flexibility and there's no difference for gifts and for talents and abilities and for personalities. There is, right? But there's still a way God intends us to raise. And in Ephesians 6, 4, we read earlier, it lays that out in broad terms that we raise them in the training and instruction of the Lord. Now, what we do is not a ceremony today. It's a commitment. It's a commitment. We're going to ask for and neglect to make. It's a commitment to be godly parents. And part of what that means is that we're going to raise godly kids. We have to be godly parents. And it's hard. And I know that. If we want the child to be right with God, we need to be right with God. And set that example. It means that we have to teach the child the things of Christ. It means raising her in a healthy church where the gospel is taught and the Bible is taken seriously. It means loving her enough to impose discipline. It means letting God discipline you and demonstrating what it means to live under discipline. It means praying for her. It means discipling her. It means making your marriage a priority. It means making your home a holy place. We live in a world where temptation comes at us from every direction. And your home ought to be a place 
It's never going to be free of temptation, but it ought to be a place that is safe where we can find refuge and rest in the cares of the world. And then lastly, giving our children to God is a, it's a dem demonstration of, of, our, of our claim to God's plan and promises for that child's life. Isaac inherited God's blessings. He inherited God's promise and God's provision. And why did he inherit those things? He inherited those things because his father, Abraham, gave him back to God. It's because Abraham believed. It's because Abraham was the man God called him to be. It's because Abraham raised that. This is why Isaac was the son of promise. Why he was, went on to be the father of these great nations. Listen. Uh, our children are blessed by our obedience to God. Oh, like all of us, Elsie has free will. But the way you live will impact her relationship with others and ultimately her relationship with God. And as you obey God, and you give the child back to God, you're preparing her to receive what God has for her. So this is what it means. It means a confirmation of our Love for Christ, it's a clarification of who owns the child. It's a commitment to raise the child under the Lordship of Christ. And it's a claiming God's plan, His best, for that child's life. And this is what transpired. This is what happened when Abraham took Isaac up on the mountain. This is what happened when Isaac, uh, Abraham laid Isaac on that altar. And this is what God still expects of us. And so Warner and Nicolette, if you'll bring Elsie up here. This is, by the way, where we're going to come to the participation part of the program. Right? You'll all tell us who you can read on me. Oh. 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 Okay. Warner and Nicolette, as young parents, recognize the sacredness of, the responsi of their responsibility. And that's why we're doing this. And they realize that God has entrusted this little one to them. And by doing this, they acknowledge publicly their responsibility for the training, for the nurture of the child. Not just to be healthy, but to come up in the ways of the Lord, righteousness and godliness. And so I'm going to ask you as a congregation, as family, do you promise to stand with them and see to it that Warner and Nicolette have the support of their family and of the body of Christ in prayer, in training, and encouragement as Elsie matures. And so if so, answer we do. So Warner and Nicolette, do you, as her parents, recognize her as a gift of God entrusted to you by God? And you give her to the Lord for whatever purpose God I'm going to get emotional. Uh, may have for her and for her life. And we you seek by your example, by your prayers, by your love and discipline, and your instruction in God's Word to raise her so that early in life she might come to know Jesus as her Savior and follow Him. Or you got a passage of Scripture to read? Deuteronomy 6, verse 4, again. Uh, hear, o Lord, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. The, the meaning of Elsie's name is sort of its inherent meaning. And I don't know how names get meanings, right? That's a mystery. Somebody probably knows. But Elsie's name means something along the lines of pledged to God or God is my oath. And so our prayer, my prayer for her, is that one day she will pledge herself to follow Christ. Even as Warren and Nicolette have pledged and you've pledged, to help and disciple her. And so, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, 
We present Elsie Catherine Collier to God, to his protection, and to his saving and his sanctifying grace. Let's, let's pray together. God, thank you for this little one. God, you know we love her. We love mom and dad. And we pray that your richest blessings would pour out on her. And that you would use her. God, and you'd use her in ways that we can't even imagine right now. Help us to all help love and disciple and nurture her as she grows, as she matures. And God, we pray that early she would come to know and love you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.